I come at this role as someone who worked at the EDO in Queensland for nine years. I've just spotted Rachel Wormsley from EDO New South Wales at the back, so welcome to you, Rachel. Um, so I had the great pleasure of being involved in some of the EPBC uh, federal court cases early on in the Act's uh, development and history. So I guess in that sense, I'm, um, that's all I've ever known. I only ever practised under the EPBC Act, so my reform ideas have tended to gravitate around how we improve that structure. But I want to say at the outset that I think that structure is a broken one. And I think if you look at all of the indicators for how our biodiversity is travelling, how our climate's travelling, um, how things like our soil health is travelling, they're all heading in the wrong direction. So we mustn't be doing it right because the outcomes just aren't there. Uh, so I'm sort of in this odd position of trying to, at the moment, defend the EPBC Act from being further weakened when in fact what I'd like to be campaigning on is strengthening it or replacing it with something entirely different that is effective. Um, so I want to come at the end of my um, presentation to ways that I think we could work with the EPBC Act to improve it. But I, I am totally open to, in fact, an entirely new piece of legislation that wasn't written by John Howard that might actually deliver for the environment. So I look forward to um, perhaps discussing that further with Mark. And I, um, I was pleased to hear that the Labor Party is thinking um, outside the box and is open to ideas about that kind of um, shape of future environmental law too. Uh, so with that said, for the last um, few years we've been campaigning to stop this notion of a one-stop shop, this um, delegation of approval powers down to state governments. And it came as a bit of a shock, and I, Mark's gone through the history quite well, but I just want to supplement that a little. It came as a bit of a shock initially um, when the Gillard government decided that it would use that part of the EPBC Act which allowed delegation of approval powers. Um, given that Bob Hawke and before him, of course, Gough had been a real champion of the Commonwealth moving into this area and had gone all the way to the High Court in the Franklin Dam case that I'm sure you're all intimately familiar with. Um, it, was, it was quite a shock to be facing this proposal. So um, folk in the Places You Love Alliance, the environment groups from around the nation, um, the Greens in the Parliament, um, and generally concerned community members banded together and ran a strong campaign about what was at stake here and why it was such a poor <coughs> idea to put state governments in charge of not just nationally significant icons, but internationally significant icons. Because as we know from our constitution, that's the whole reason that the Commonwealth is in this area. Um, it's using that foreign affairs power to try and protect internationally significant things like Ramsar wetlands, like biodiversity, like world heritage. And the notion that that could be given to state governments who, let's face it, have a really bad track record on environmental issues and who barely met a development proposal that they don't adore. There's been so few refusals, and particularly in the mining space, um, that, you know, you can count them on one hand in the history of, of our very existence. So that idea was, was just um, uh, quite a confronting one. I'm really pleased that with the um, political pressure, with the community pressure, and I think with the mounting evidence that actually the state systems were a total dog's breakfast, and far from creating a one-stop shop, you'd actually end up creating an eight-stop shop, which was entirely different from each other. I think it was that final um, straw that, that saw the Gillard government decide to abandon the proposal, and we absolutely welcomed that. Unfortunately, by that stage, Tony Abbott had cottoned on to the idea, and no doubt the Business Council um, was in his ear as well, because you know there's really not much in between the Abbott government and the, and the business community. Uh, so sadly, that proposal was um, reignited once the government changed. Now, um, we have put a bill to the Senate to remove that part of the UPBC Act that allows approval powers to be delegated. Um, it had gone to inquiry, and as Mark said, none of the business community members, the VCA and the Minerals Council, the QRC, none of them could actually provide any evidence, A, that there was any delay being caused by the approval phase as opposed to the assessment phase, which I'm sure you guys can distinguish between, but um, others tend to deliberately conflate. Um, so there was no delay, therefore there was no cost attributed to that portion of the process, um, and there was no um, actual evidence, therefore, of a cost to community or, or per proposal. Um, and so we asked and asked, like, give us some examples, guys, back this up with actual evidence, and they just weren't able to. So I found that very telling, and I'm pleased that Mark has um, confirmed that that's his understanding as well, despite the numerous opportunities for them to provide that evidence. They can't because it isn't there. Uh, I want to move to that conflation because 
we all know that we have assessment bylights in place between the Commonwealth and the state. So I think the New South Wales one is under review at the minute. I'm from Queensland, so I know most about that system. But we've had assessment bylights in place for ages, and generally they've worked okay. The concept that you don't have to prepare two sets of documents is a good concept. The fact that you would just do one EIS, and again, Mark mentioned this, whereby one set of studies that covers the terms of reference for both bits of legislation that you're working under, that's a good idea. Um, the community consultation period, as long as it's not um, less than it otherwise would have been under the EPBC Act, again, good idea to do it that way. So like, um, like Mark, we're open to the idea of looking at those assessment bylaws to see if there can be some improvements made there. That's a principled approach, but I do want to flag that in Queensland, what we saw under our former state government um, was the addition of a new, frankly, a new low in environmental impact assessment. Um, an amendment to our State Development Act, which is like our major projects legislation in Queensland, which was basically like a preliminary documentation for the most significant projects that you could possibly be um, considering in Queensland. So whilst we agree that the, that the assessment bylaws could be, um, could be utilised in a more fulsome way, you can't just accredit any old cruddy process. There's got to be some kind of um, standard here. So that's, that's my rider on, um, on assessment violence. Um, the talks have rolled on, and obviously with the change of the Senate um, last year now, uh, the shape of the crossbench has changed, and the Abbott government needs uh, either the Greens or six of the eight crossbenchers, or of course Labor, um, to get their proposals through. I'm thrilled that the Labor Party have um, continued their strong position about opposing this idea. The Greens have been resolute about that as well. We just need a few more folk to be able to stop that in the Senate. And that's what's occupied my time um, quite a lot in the last year. And I'm really pleased, and, and I'm, I'm not telling any secrets here, we've, we've made this public, I'm really pleased that after discussions with the Palmer Party, that we were able to get them to agree in writing to block the handoff of powers. And how we managed to achieve that um, was they were proposing an inquiry into the Newman government in Queensland at the time, um, making allegations that they were corrupt and you know, generally awful. You know, they, they are generally awful. They're now the former government, which I'm very pleased about. Anyway, the point we made to them was, look, if you think these guys are so atrocious that they warrant an entire Senate inquiry into them, why on earth would you be voting to give them more powers over internationally significant parts of our environment? And they ultimately saw the logic of that argument. The inquiry was established, and we have a written agreement that they will vote against not only the bylaws themselves, but also the legislation to um, not facilitate the bylaws, but to allow an expanded bylaw to go ahead. And I want to come to that now, because this is where the government's rhetoric falls to pieces. They have a bill before the Senate, which thankfully is, is currently blocked, and I hope remains so. It's called the um, EPBC Amendment Bilateral Agreement Implementation Bill, 2014. Can I just get a hands up for people who are familiar with that bill? Most of you, great. It's a really bad bill. <laughs> so the concept of approval bylaws is insulting enough to, to me as someone who thinks that the Commonwealth should play an appropriate role in protecting international icons. But this bill just takes it to a new low. So there's three key aspects that I vehemently object to. The first, and Mark flagged this, is that it allows the handoff of powers for international environmental icons to be administered not just by state governments, who through a review by EDO have already shown their systems are woefully inadequate, not just to states but also to local councils, who do a marvellous job in their sphere of responsibility and deserve constitutional recognition in the Greens view, but who do not have the capability, the resources or the expertise to be administering federal environmental laws. Okay, so just no, stop, so that's councils. Um, the, second, the second part of that bill is of course to give the water trigger away. Um, now I was really pleased to work with Tony Windsor when he was still in the parliament. He's a wonderful and um, ethical man. And I was thrilled that in the conversations we had with him, we were able to convince him that his original water trigger bill, back before we had a water trigger, which included in the second half a devolution of that trigger back down to states. We had long discussions with him about how that was basically an approval by like by another name. It was going to be an atrocious idea. If you're going to create this thing, don't give it away back to the same people who've shown that they're not up to the job in the first place. So um, Tony then went in discussions with the then uh, Gillard government 
was able to insist on a particular clause in the EPBC Act that stopped the water trigger from being handed off under any future approval by that. So um, uh, that was a fantastic outcome. So of course this bill needs to remove that particular provision. Um, the third part of the bill, which I think is the worst and which most undermines the government's own rhetoric about the standards won't drop and that it somehow doesn't matter who the decision maker is, despite the fact that we all know there's huge discretion in the EPBC Act, so clearly it does matter who the decision maker is, and it does matter what the objects of the Act are, and if you delegate that down to states, they won't have the pro-environment EPBC objects, they'll be using the pro-industry objects of the State Development Act, for example, um, and yet they'll retain that discretion. So you would have thought that the standards would have to be enforceable in order to stop the states just doing a business as usual and treating this like a box ticking exercise. There's a clause in that bill that indicates that the standards don't have to be fully reflected in state law. They can be partially reflected in mere policy. Now, um, I've had discussions with the departmental folks and I want to acknowledge um, uh, Dean Moodson, who's here in the front row from the uh, Federal Department of the Environment. And I'm sorry we've had some cross discussions in estimates about this very point, but you've done a laudable job in your role as a public servant. Um, but I think this is a dangerous clause that basically says those standards don't need to be adhered to. So uh, every time Minister Hunt and, and his um, compatriots talk about how it doesn't matter who the decision maker is because we're going to lift the states, you know, the states are going to be, um, it doesn't matter who is making this call because the standards will be enforceable. No, your own legislation says that they won't be enforceable. So we have railed against this um, in the parliament and will continue to do so. And that's why it's important that we block not just that bill, but also the bylaws themselves. So um, the agreement with the Palmer Party includes disallowing the bylaws themselves once those instruments table, hopefully they never are, but it importantly includes um, voting down that bill. So that's just a, a potted summary of the one-stop shop. Can I just check how I've got for time? Because I've got a whole lot of other stuff I want to go into. Great. All right, now I want to move now to how we could improve the system that we've currently got, because obviously, Stopping the handoff of powers is about holding the line when in fact we should be looking at lifting our ambitions and how we can start to turn those indicators of environmental health back around so that we're not just gradually cooking this planet and, and killing off species. Like I say, these could either be amendments to the EPBC Act or they could form the basis of principles of an entirely new piece of legislation um, that ideally would be administered in a sort of whole of government way. Um, the first issue is a climate trigger. Now we think there should be a climate trigger in either the EPBC Act or whatever federal act we might have in the future. And there's been a long debate about this, particularly when we had a carbon price. There was an argument that, well, you're kind of covering that off in a regulatory sense already. Why would you need an extra climate trigger? Um, well, the carbon pricing mechanism did not include the environmental impacts of, that, of those emissions. Yes, there was a price signal, and you know, I look forward to the day when we can get that back, and I'm confident that we will, because hey, look at the rest of the world. We can't be laggards for, for too long. Um, but we need a climate trigger to factor in those environmental um, impacts. And when you've got an act that when a huge coal mine or um, massive coal seam gas well with, with huge problems with fugitive emissions, the nonsense of having a federal environment minister have to tick off on just the water aspects and not even look at the climate impacts like, to the person on the street, that sounds like the laws really aren't working very well and they're incredibly siloed. So we've long advocated for a climate trigger and we'll continue to do so. Just moving to that water trigger, um, you know, we used to not even have to look at the water impacts of those mines or coal seam gas, so at least we've taken a step forward in that regard. But it's only for coal seam gas and it's only for large coal mines. And unfortunately, we've seen a massive expansion of coal seam gas across the east, east coast but we've now got a new frontier of shale and tight gas applications that's hitting the rest of the country. Now, um, we know that the same sorts of processes are used, hydraulic fracturing, and incidentally, I've just introduced a bill this week to ban hydraulic fracturing. Um, I'm, I wasn't intending to go through that today, but if anyone's got any questions, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, but we need to include shale and tight gas in that water trigger because it makes no sense to protect people on the East Coast from the impacts of this gas extraction and forget about the rest of the country. So climate trigger and expand the water trigger are the first two points that I will make. And just briefly back on the climate trigger, if anyone's bothered to read the inter intergenerational um, report from yesterday, 
if you haven't, don't, because really not that much in it. It's a massively political document. But there used to be a whole climate chapter in that report. It's now three pages on climate. Doesn't include the projection of emissions. Clearly doesn't include any targets because you know, that's sort of the is still underway. But nor does it include anything like the economic cost of extreme weather events, which we know will get more frequent and more intense in the, the climate scenario that we're tracking on. Um, so unfortunately, it seems we've got quite a way to go. So don't expect a climate trigger anytime soon, but let's look forward to some positive development in the future. The next key item that needs to be fixed is the exemption for regional forestry agreements in the PPC Act. The RFAs have not worked. They're coming up for renewal in the next little while. Um, and we're thinking now about how to try and create some pressure around that. But effectively, the exemption says if you're conducting your forestry under a regional forest agreement that your state is, you know, that's under your state legislative system, as long as you're meeting the objects of the EPBC Act, you can just ignore the EPBC Act. Problem is, there's really very little checking back to see whether that forestry is actually achieving the environmental outcomes that an EPBC Act would make it achieve. Um, and the short answer is it's not. So I don't know why those people have an exemption. They shouldn't be exempt. Let's bring that back into the EPBC Act or some other piece of legislation that replaces the EPBC Act. Um, a national parks trigger. Great to hear Mark mention that as well. I think when we had that real barrage of state government proposals for logging, uh, for shooting in New South Wales national parks, um, we had cows reintroduced into national parks in Queensland, um, and of course the alpine grazing issue. When we had all of these plans for national parks that um, were, in my view, incredibly inconsistent with the whole notion of a national park, and when they're called national parks, um, I think they deserve national protection. So we had a bit of a think of how to design such a trigger because obviously they're creatures of state legislation despite their name and the boundaries of a national park are you know, changeable and have been reduced in, in various times by various different state governments. So we thought about how to actually capture national parks at a snapshot in time so that you could avoid any kind of um, subsequent changing to get around the trigger. Short version, it's doable and I think it's worth doing. Um, cumulative impacts. That has been one of the biggest flaws, in my view, in the EPBC Act. We had some um, some over the dicta from oh, was it Justice Keeple, I think it was, in the in the first back case that says um, that significant impact is an impact that's important, notable, or of consequence having regard to its context and intensity. And that reference to context was the only thing on which we've hung all subsequent advocacy about the need to consider cumulative impacts in the EPBC Act. Um, on a project by project basis. Now we've just got to fix that. Um, clearly, cumulative impacts are incredibly relevant to an impact that a proposal will have. You can't look at these things in isolation. So let's just fix that loophole. Um, some folk have used the fact that strategic um, assessments are more cumulative in nature as a reason for supporting strategic assessments. I think the concept is an interesting one, but I think the results have been quite dubious to date. And the circumstances for when a strategic assessment is triggered are also kind of a bit late in the piece. Like you can only even get a strat assessment if you've got multiple referrals and controlled actions in an area. So um, we kind of want bioregional planning to begin before that rush of development applications because there's always a presumption that they'll get approved and for political reasons, for economic reasons, what have you. Um, we need that cumulative um, stuff to be imbued right through the whole act, including through project by project assessment. Um, there was something else I wanted to mention. Hopefully it comes back to my mind. Um, yes, that's right. Community rights, of course. Community rights are diminished under a strat assessment. Once you have that strat assessment completed, you then can't um, seek a judicial review of the individual project decisions made under that strat assessment. So, Great that you've got cumulative impacts considered, but really bad outcomes in terms of community enforcement and participation. Um, which brings me to merits review. We've long advocated for merits review in our federal environmental laws. Um, we have that in most of our state environmental laws, and as I say, I'm most familiar with Queensland, but my understanding is that many of the state systems allow a merits review, and decision makers shouldn't be afraid of that. It shouldn't just be about whether you follow the correct process, although that's an important check and balance too. It should actually be about what the evidence dictates should be the outcome. 
So merits review is, is long needed and I'd love to see that brought in. And there's no floodgates, you know. Like we all know this, we work in this area. This is a common refrain, oh, everyone will sue us all the time. Look, it's really expensive to go to court. And unfortunately, successive governments make it even more expensive to do so. Um, and, you know, potential for cost, adverse cost orders, um, and, you know, reasonably limited standing provisions, there's not going to be a floodgates, but government should be held to accountable for their decisions, particularly in public interest areas like the environment. Um, enforcement. We talked a bit about how we can improve the actual laws, but none of that means anything if they're not properly, properly enforced. And um, Mark mentioned those Auditor General's reports. We had one of those in Queensland which showed that our Queensland mining system was woeful and poorly enforced. Um, and that conditions were poorly drafted and routinely overlooked. We had a similar review federally, which was um, quite critical of um, the department in, in its enforcement. And I want to, at this stage, absolve the department of responsibility for that. The government has cut the people who work in the department. We're tracking the number in estimates, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dean, but I think it's about 400 staff that we've lost so far. It's in that order. Anyway, you, you'll have your turn later and please please share with people um, how many good people you're losing uh, because how can we expect our departments to do a good job and to do that enforcement when they're losing staff hand over fist? So proper staffing is part of it, but it's also a culture of enforcement and a culture of compliance. Now, obviously, um, public servants are guided by the Minister of the Day and certainly in Queensland, we've had a real culture of looking the other way when conditions are breached. It's just ironic because um, often the pollies crow about the stringent and rigorous conditions. They're the two words they always use, and you, you know, you roll your eyes every time they do, because you know they're generally not stringent or rigorous. Not only that, they're rarely enforced, and everybody knows it. Everybody in the business community knows it, and everybody in the community knows it. So it's a joke. You've got a bit of paper, and um, it sits in the bottom drawer. Now that's wrong. Okay, we've got it. We've got a decent legal system that needs improving. But if it's not enforced, then it's meaningless. So, um, proper enforcement and let's get some of that, those staff back into the Environment Department and allow them to give that frank and fearless advice um, that, that is in fact their duty. Um, the next thing that I think needs changing is the input into the system, the information, because um, across the whole country you have your EISs prepared by proponents or consultants paid by proponents. Now, um, we all work in this area and so we've sort of become used to that notion, but to the average person on the street, that sounds inherently, um, I won't use the word corrupt, but how can you get an independent source of information that's provided by someone that wants an approval? Okay, It's, just a, it's a common sense kind of um, problem with having information that's not independently sourced and that's, in, importantly, not independently ground truthed by those decision makers precisely because they lack the resources um, to do that work. So I've had discussions on this um, issue for many years and it's a fascinating topic and I really welcome your ideas about how we can better craft an independent EIS system in a way that doesn't just shift the cost away from proponents because they should bear that cost, but in a way that they're not paying for the result that they want and in a way that doesn't disparage the good work that environmental consultants do. I'm certainly not saying that they're all just on the take and, and write what they're paid to write, but there is an influence that if you don't write what you know will be acceptable, you probably won't get work from that client again. So there is a tendency, um, I think, uh, and I'm not imputing any ill will here or making any specific ac accusations, but the system does lead to that um, slant. We've got to fix that. So I'd like to see a system where the proponent still pays for that work to get done, but perhaps that money is administered by government or administered by an independent commission. Um, and it has that um, both reality but also perception of independence. But like I say, we're open to ideas about models of how to achieve that outcome, but we need more independent information flowing into the system on which those decisions can be based. Um, I'm almost finished. Um, proportionary principle. We've got it on the law books, but everybody seems to ignore it. And coal seam gas is the best example, and I just had a big rant in the chamber on this um, yesterday about coal seam gas. We've got all of the expert bodies, including now the actual independent expert scientific committee on coal and coal seam gas, not just the more generic CSIROs and National Water Commission, while we still have the National Water Commission. Um, but we've got a specific body to look at water impacts. 
And their advices, because they do project by project advices as well as feed into bioregional planning, their advices are really strong. Um, I'd encourage you all to have a read. They're not super long, they, they keep it nice and tight, but they frequently identify huge gaps in the information that proponents have provided, and they frequently hint at the potential for long-term damage to water from this industry and from those projects specifically. So when we have clear indications from the expert bodies that are saying, look, we really don't have enough information to know that we're not doing lasting damage, it's a classic, classic case for the application of the precautionary principle, and yet, you know, nothing's ever refused. So clearly the precautionary principle isn't being fulsomely applied. I'd like to see it properly applied, and, and coal seam gas, in my view, would be the first candidate um, to be on the receiving end of that. Um, two more points. Fettering the minister's discretion. We've got a system that's not too bad, and I've outlined how it should be improved in, how I think it should be improved in many ways, but ultimately it falls down at that end part because the minister's got such a broad discretion. Not only does he have to, and it's always, I'll say he, because it's always been a bloke, but let's hope we can have some more women in the ministries. Um, I'd have to wait for a change of government for that, but um, we, we live in hope. Um, the environment minister has to weigh up not just the environmental considerations on which the whole EIS stream has come to their desk about, but they can then add on social and economic considerations at the very end. Now, I'm not in theory opposed to that because those are valid considerations as well, although arguably they would be the province of other ministers to make those decisions, and you would think that the environment minister should at least have to prioritise the environment in that sort of um, list of things. They don't, that there's no weighting of those issues. But importantly, and I've asked in estimates about this as well, and Dean will remember this, they don't actually seek independent advice on the economic and social impacts of a proposal. I've asked, you know, do you talk to Treasury? You know, who do you get to kind of verify what the proponent's claiming? And jobs claims are often the key point. And particularly for mining projects, they always claim that they create, you know, hundreds and thousands of jobs. Frequently, it doesn't eventuate like that. And so if you're gonna factor in economic and social considerations at that most crucial end phase of the actual decision, where's your independent evidence to verify what the proponent's claiming? So um, that's a tangential point. In terms of discretion, I think there should be more fetters on that discretion to say, no, you can't take a decision that will send a species to extinction. Or even, or even stronger than that, that you shouldn't be able to take a decision that um, bumps up a species to one high level of threat, for example. We just need to fetter that discretion. I've got a few ideas. I haven't finalised my thinking, and I would welcome your thoughts on how we can improve that. Um, the final point I want to make is the trigger for when the BBC Act even kicks in at all. We know it's got to be a significant impact. We know it's got to be on a matter of national environmental significance. Now, there's not many of those. Um, it's an incredibly <coughs> siloed approach. So we've had discussions about which of those thresholds would you change to make the EPBC Act work better? Would you just look at impacts that um, are less than significant, some other, some other bar for when the EPBC Act would kick in? Or should you broaden out the Commonwealth's responsibility using either the Foreign Affairs power or the Court's power? There's, you know, the High Court's confirmed we can basically do what we like, which is nice, thanks High Court. Um, should you broaden that out so that all aspects of the environment are considered, but keep the significance threshold? I'm really interested in the interplay of how we could um, make the Act work more effectively, or indeed replace it with a new Act. So I haven't finished my thinking on these sorts of issues, and, and I really welcome your, your comments and your input. Um, I can't stay all day because we've been in Canberra for two weeks and I have a beautiful five-year-old girl who I promised I will pick up from school at three o'clock. So I'm gonna stay till a lunch break um, and I'm gonna stay to hear the department's contribution and then I have to run. So if anyone's got some comments, please either grab me at morning tea or um, please email me, senator.waters at aph.gov.au and I'd really like to continue this conversation. Thanks for your interest and your good work in this area.